what's going on? This is your man, Big Stu, Scott Stewart, or Professor Stewart, depending on how you know me. And we are back for yet another episode of Dope People, where I have the pleasure of bringing on amazing people who are doing just some absolutely amazing things, primarily in the field of education. But as we progress, we're opening up the door a little bit more. So well, now we're bringing on entrepreneurs and business owners and people in the community and in politics that are just as dope as some of these educators and by their own right are educating the people as well. And today is no different. Today we have with us Mr. Omari Kamal and he spent most of his young life, and I mean that, young life, thinking that he would become a scientist when he grew up. After all, his favorite person in his in the world, his mother was a chemistry teacher and former scientist. So it seemed only right. After a rather unpleasant experience in his first year of college chemistry, he decided to go into another direction. And it wasn't science anymore, but he majored in mechanical engineering. Still only mildly interested in the subject and some deep reflection, Omari finally discovered that the only thing that he had ever naturally been interested in was money. It still is money. He was still conflicted. However, since there were many aspects of the applied sciences, that's what he liked. Frankly, he had become quite good at it. But then he asked himself this question, why can't I be a financial scientist? Wow, that's amazing. A financial scientist. Eureka! Omari completed his undergraduate studies with a degree in finance and went on a few years later to earn his MBA in financial analysis. Omari has worked in the corporate sector. He's been an investment advisor. He's worked with as a CPA. And he switched around, moved around, met some people, rubbed some elbows. Nevertheless, he decided to start his own business. A new question arose. Can there be a formula, a set of principles or laws that govern the financial success of growing businesses? Is that possible? I think we have the answer or the man with the answer to that question with us today. Unable to formulate a good enough answer to his last question, Omari proceeded Two, over the next decade or so, move around to different companies, taking a variety of accounting-related positions, ranging from corporate finance to private equity. In his last role, working as a private equity professional, Amari was struck with the ideal of establishing an investment market for community-based retail, service, manufacturing, and distribution businesses. The new question is now, what would be possible? If small businesses knew how to and had the support networks to grow their companies like large ones do. And since this time, Omari's vision has been to take the mystery out of small business success by teaching entrepreneurs and their teams how to scale versus merely growing. Omari, Omari. Welcome to the show. Make it sound so good, brother. Stop, man. Stop telling me. Thank you for having me. Hey, man, it is a pleasure having you on Dope People. I mean, I, I try to reserve this seat for the most amazing people in my network, brother. And you top that list year oh. in, year out. Oh, bro, that's a, that's a high honor coming from you, man. I, oh, I, man, it's real. Well, it's real. Thank you. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you, no. thank you. This is not a game, brother. As much fun as we have, and mm. you know, we have a lot of fun here. This is serious work. I mean, we've had educators over nations. We've had educators in other countries on this show. 
Right. We've even uh, had a billionaire on this show. We've had some amazing teachers, authors. Hey, man, you deserve to be here on my Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do it all. Now, that gives us a bit of the professional side of you. You know, it's all business. It's kind of, you know, I added my spin to it. But yeah, it really doesn't tell us, like, who you are, mm. you know. And we have a, a theme on the Dope People podcast. Okay. We'd like to engage you in a friendly round of this or that. Uh, Are you familiar with this or that? I, I played it one other time, I believe. You have, so you. I, I have. You know how it goes. A, a little bit, yeah. You, you you give me some some options, and I pick one, and it it, it, it likely will say a lot about who I am about about what I pick. Yeah, at least at least we'll draw some conclusions about it about you anyway. I think some conclusions are going to be drawn either way, so we may as well. So let, let's. That's right. Now the whole thing about it with this is, try not to overthink your responses. Got it. Just try to get to it. Okay. So um, here we go. Let's just start. Talk or listen? Listen. Write or type? Type. Mm. Travel by plane or travel by boat? Plane. Deep dish or thin crust? Deep dish. Wow. Rain or snow? Rain. Reading or writing? Writing. Day or night? Day. Comedy or horror? Comedy. Fruits or vegetables? Vegetables. Piercings or tattoos? Tattoos. Circles or squares? I'm going to overthink this with circles. <laughs> I don't have no idea. You have to come back to why we, Why you want to overthink that one. Tell us about that. Why would you overthink that one? I don't, I don't know. I just, it, 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 that every other answer seemed like the right answer to me. But that one just, I, I really, I don't know. I don't care. I, I'm not. I, 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 you gave me the perfect disclaimer. I am an overthinker, so uh, I, I don't know that I could help. But that was the perfect one to just boggle my mind completely. So it, it was perfect answer. So I, I don't know. Wow. Maybe because it just, there was nothing I could connect it to that yeah. I had any frame of reference for. I don't know. Maybe oh, okay. Keep, keep using that with other guests. See, see, see what what comes of it. Okay. All right. I like that. Okay. Mm. Apples or oranges? Apples. Okay. Cookies or cake? Cake. All right. Now we're about to dig in a little bit. Banks or online payment systems? Banks. Okay. If I, I got to pick one, right? I can't. I can't. Okay. Yeah. You said don't know the thing, but I'm like. Is this or that? I mean, that. Yeah. That that probably deserves a bit of an explanation. Maybe we'll come back to that one. Um, cash currency or digital currency? Digital. Mm. PWI or HBCU? HBCU. Teachers or parents? Parents. Traditional schooling or homeschooling? Traditional. Okay. All right. Let's bring it on home. Here we go. Mm -hmm. It's getting kind of serious here. Mm. I just feel people arguing with my with, with my this and that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all right. We're, we're about to dig in. It's about to get. I, I love it. I just can't wait to see the comment. Yeah, we're about to get heavy. About to get heavy, man. Uh -huh. Sitting or standing. Standing. Family or friends? Family. Hot or cold? Hot. All day long. All right, here we go. Last couple ones right here. 
television or YouTube? YouTube. Socks or barefoot? Barefoot. Last one. Young or old? Young. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You did it. There's no pass or fail. You just completed it. <laughs> let us into your psyche, man. You let us into your psyche a little bit. Thank you for being such a joyous guest of this or that. I hope you have one of those personality profiles you can print out. And yeah, you know, right? We may need to make that a thing on the show. We haven't gone that far, but it's, we're leaning in that way. But we don't want to. No, we're not going to psychoanalyze you in that degree. But just thank you for letting us in. You know, it's an opportunity for some of our listeners to have a, a even more of a reason to connect with you. Mm. Said a couple of things that maybe they would have said, so now they they like you a little bit more. So we want to dig into a couple of the, those. There were a couple of big points around banking and uh, the circle and the square, which you've already kind of cleared up for us. But before yeah. we go back and circle back to that, no pun intended. <laughs> who were you, sixth grade? Sixth grade Omari. What kind of what kind of student were you? Who were you at that time? Yeah, that's an interesting question, man. Sixth grade. Um, I was in the midst of um my my parents, my mother and my stepfather starting to go through what would later become a, a very brutal divorce. And at the same time, I was coming into my own as I, I, I believe that we as human beings have three sort of phases that we go through in life that are pretty universal to all of us. Um, the first of which they call the, the end of innocence, which typically happens around, you know, three to five years old when you finally determine or, or decide, or we all decide for ourselves that something's very wrong or dangerous with the world and we, develop our, our sort of psyche, our ways of being around, uh, defending ourselves against that thing, whatever that thing was that sort of shook us into some level of awareness of that. And I think we go on a few years. And another very important part of the formulation of our identity is uh, uh, sort of a, a, an assertion that we don't belong and we kind of develop some way of being around belonging. Uh, to the groups that we find ourselves a part of. And I think later on in life, close to Adelpha, we go through this third phase called uh, I'm all alone. And we have to develop ourselves in some way to deal with being alone in life. And each of us have different responses to whatever those moments in time are. But I think that sixth grade moment was like the, the I don't belong here moment. I didn't quite fit in with the kids on 114th and Eccleston. I'm from a, a neighborhood called Roseland. And so uh, back in those days, there was a big deal being made of these things called magnet schools. I don't know if magnet schools are still around like that, um, but there's a selective enrollment. But anyway, but these were supposed to be the, the, the better schools. You took these tests. And so I got accepted to one of these schools. So I get bused to another side of town to the east side. And I went to this other school. So I didn't quite fit in where I belonged over on 114th and Eccleston. I for sure didn't fit in with this group uh that was uh that i was being bused to over in the southeast side and um and i think what 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 i would share with you and the listening audience is that um what what i think came of that was sort of a what i would call a toughness or a resilience or uh 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 just to you know just forget everybody i'm just gonna put my head down and just bear through it and uh and 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 learned how to enjoy my own company and and go it along and not 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 rely on too many people for too many things and i'm not saying that like it's a like it's something to brag about but i think if you know if anybody were interested in getting to know me and they they saw that i was something of a, of a loner or uh, uh of an, an independent leaning type of guy mm -hmm. i think that's where a lot of that that came from so yeah i mean just to ask your question i'm not, I'm not sure yeah, you know, no, no. where, if any place you're going with that question, but I mean, I think that's, oh, yeah. that, that's the first thing that comes to mind with, with what was going on for young Omari Kamal during that point in his life. 
what kind of student were you? What kind of grades were you? So you got you you tested in you. For those who aren't quite clear, magnet school means you don't have to go to the community school. It's a selective school, school yeah. of choice, a school of promise, a school where people want to be. You hope your kid is test well enough to get in there. Yeah. And so I don't want to assume, but you you had pretty good grades, so you were pretty yeah, good. Yeah, a good student. I mean, my my family was really really big on education. Yeah, uh, mom was a so. chemistry teacher. Yeah, mom was a chemistry teacher. Mom scientist. was a, a scientist at one point or another. A lot of families sit around the table and they talk about politics or religion or money. We talked about science uh, and all the many different laws and principles and whatnot that are associated with science. And we got really deep with it. And my mother, you know, uh, if she were here, she 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 punched me in the arm because she just knew I was going to be a doctor and pressed me. To, to be one and that's what I spent the majority of my life thinking that I, I would become until like you mentioned in the introduction that fateful uh, uh, encounter that I had with, with college level chemistry and, and it wasn't it wasn't bad necessarily I mean it certainly had its rough moments but it was it was more like this this is not something I could ever see myself doing uh, and, and, and there's, a, there's perhaps another story I'll tell later about the time I got to volunteer uh, um, uh, at a hospital during a local crisis, and I got to really deal with what medical professionals would uh, maybe not even deal with it like I like I had any real real encounter like they do any real encounter with it. But I had a glimpse, like a moment, like a snap of what it looks like when crisis erupts, and you're in the middle of a of a massive healthcare sort of crisis, and what medical professionals have to do have to deal with. And I. A, developed a whole new appreciation of what those first responders have to deal with mm -hmm. in certain types of situations, and B, very quickly determined that that's not me. I'm not. I'm not cut for that kind of kind of life. And I very quickly changed from chemistry to uh, 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 engineering, like you said in the intro. But to answer your question, I've generally always been a good student, and that's sort of been my way of 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 getting through life, reading books, intellectualizing, and kind of like I said earlier thinking or overthinking or thinking that I could think my way through just about anything. Look, I'm an accountant for Pete's sake. So right. that I think that hits at, at some level of, of, of a propensity for analysis. And yeah, that's, that's one of my strong suits for sure. It always has been. I heard you say most people sit around the table and they talk, mm -hmm. you know, politics or money or, mm. uh, we're from similar, you know, we're, I, I didn't even really realize this until we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Mm. I'm from 113th of Peoria. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. And we were walking distance from each other. Mm. Right. Um, and uh, our neighborhood was relatively decent, you know, mm. so. But we didn't sit around talking about those things. We did sit around the table, but we didn't talk about money or business or science or math or those things and there are a lot more families other families i mean obviously there's some families that did mm. uh, but then there are a lot of other families who just simply didn't right yeah, and we see some of that show up today my family's not even i don't even know if people still sit at the table during the week for dinner if there's dinner time is still a theme in yeah. our in our households, particularly, it's the same, but I, I don't think people do by and large anymore. Right, especially people that look like us. That's right. How, let's talk to me about family. Now, I, I want to get into some of the stuff about the work that you do now, and when you yeah. really started to find an appreciation book for numbers, and let's talk about some business stuff as well. But talk to me about family. Like, how important is your family to you? I, you know, how, where does that fall into your priority list? Yeah. Um, it's it's fundamentally important, but you know, but not from I think uh, from where some people might guess it would come from, like from some deeply sort of moralistic stance about it. Um, uh, my mother, so so kind of picking up on the thing that we were just talking about with my mother, um, you know, she 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 don't consider this gospel. I'm not saying anything bad about my mother. She is she is a, a devoutly agnostic woman i mean she's just she's a scientist mm -hmm. and so many scientists many academicians many, many intellectuals are, are, are aren't the most religious people in the world so, and that's how she raised my younger brother and sister and i to be 
uh, more more um, more followers of logic than we would be of any 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 deity. And and yet, as I got older, I became very curious about people who follow certain faith traditions because just this idea of of, of you know a, a white man sitting on a cloud uh, uh, manifesting himself in people's lives just never really made much sense to me. And so I, I could say a lot about that. I mean, I'm coming and just I'm, I'm going to come back to your your question about family, but there there but my sort of discovery in life, and this is my mother's sort of edict to us, was that you you there's nothing in life that you can't apply a certain level of logic to and make some profound discovery to. And I and I found that to be the case in a lot of instances, whether it had to do with religion, whether it had to do with my own principle set certainly with respect to how I came to do what I do for a living uh, but but even with respect to this whole subject of family so so primarily what I'm interested in from the standpoint of being a uh, a, a, a financial manager an accountant a financial advisor uh, a small business consultant is somebody who's very deeply interested in not just offering those services because uh, they, they make me a living, but but primarily because they're critical in the aspect in the broader aspects of what I think are necessary for community development, which is something that I'm very very passionate about. So fundamentally, what I do is not just to do it, but rather to build powerful, strong communities. And I just happen to believe that one of the critical elements of what it takes to develop communities is to uh, uh, to to build strong businesses, but of but but right there, I mean, not even like a more important or a less important, but like right there in terms of the, the order of, of priorities for, for developing strong communities, particularly in the urban center, particularly in, uh, uh, in, in African-American communities, is uh, having strong family, having a strong sense of family and repairing a lot of the damage that's been done over the last 60, 70, 80 years uh, mm -hmm. to our family uh, by virtue of really having some powerful conversations like these and in other venues where we begin to talk about what are our values with respect to families? Why don't we sit around the table and talk about these 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 concepts? And it doesn't matter to me what it is. It could be mm -hmm. you know, religion, it could be uh, finance, it could be, it, heck, it, it could be other people. Gossip, it, it, like, I know it sounds crazy to say, like, you know, but talk to each other. There's, to there's each other. always something available when groups of people come together and talk and, and, and debate and, 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 and go back and forth about ideas. There's always something that miraculous that happens in that space. But because, in my opinion, family isn't something that's revered like it could be, like mm -hmm. like I, I would say it should be. Uh, it, it puts you know us and by us, I mean black folks uh, in particular, but but every all of us really who are kind of subscribing to this culture such that that I think pulls for for us not needing as much as needing each other as much as we once did. Um, it, it, it results in a, in a sort of a ripple effect that, that affects us in so many other ways that we don't immediately, we're not able to immediately connect the dots with. When did you, when did you, I mean, that's huge. And I think I'm not even a hundred percent sure where this conversation will end up. And I, and the thing is, it's going to be spaghetti. <laughs> it might there. be a good thing, man. I think, I think so. Right. Because we, we do have a a defined period of time for this conversation in this mm -hmm. format. But um, I'm I'm excited to let people into kind of our minds a little bit. When we when you and I get together, we have some amazing discord, right? Mm -hmm. Some amazing sure. conversations. So when did you first begin to what's your what's your money story? When did you first come into contact with money and the importance of it and how to leverage it and use it for the benefit of the people of the community. Yeah, so I'm I was born in a place called Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, so I spent my formative years for the most part in the South. So I was uh, born to a single mother in the late 1970s, in 1977, and uh, in, in in the South, and and even and I, I don't consider myself old old. But uh, but I'm old enough uh, such that back when I was born, it still wasn't cool to have a kid out of wedlock. So my mother ended up leaving Mississippi, uh, which is a very poverty-stricken place. Anybody, anybody who understands, you know, the South 
just in general, but especially so back then. Um, and she came to Iowa City to finish her education. But when she, and, and you know, even though I, I'm not a <clears throat> educated in the strictest sense of the word, my mother was. I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm thinking that lets me in the club, and it's part of what got me on this podcast, which I'll take mm-hmm. any day of the week. But, uh, but she had a profound influence on me, and uh, and 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 even, but but that aside. My mother, while she was finishing her education, would send me back to the South to live with my grandmother. And I ended up ended up being a situation where I had to stay with my grandmother and my grandfather. And again, for, for the, a good amount of my formative years. So um, if, I, if I could just paint a picture, I mean, that, that, that my, I lived on a place called Cotton Street. I lived on a street called Cotton Street, which had no paved roads. Uh, the, the majority of the houses that that were in my neighborhood were what you call shotgun houses. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, but they call them shotgun houses because you could almost quite literally shoot a gun through the front door and the bullet would go clean out the back because it was just, it wasn't what most people think of as a house. It was more like a box with a few walls here, there, and the other place. And, uh, and, 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 we didn't have a lot. There just wasn't a lot there, and and but it was a blessing though because I think for for the majority of that time, uh, uh, we were so poor we didn't know we we're poor because everybody else was poor. Uh, it didn't feel that way, and there were other things that we had to be concerned about than making more money. So it was a deeply joyous thing. And I mean, clearly as a child, I didn't know what to make of that. I didn't I didn't know poor from 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 rich or anything of the sort. But when my mother finished her education, she ended up at the same time getting married to a man who uh, she met at the University of Iowa. And then she took me back up from Mississippi and we moved to Chicago, uh, where I spent another large chunk of my young life. And as they uh, uh, met and became engaged and became married and uh, uh, bought a house together and built a life together and then fell out of love and then eventually became divorced. Uh, of, of all of those instances, what I could share with you that that really became a critical part of my money story was something that my mother would say to me, and uh, and then I, I I believe and I'm, I'm tempted to be modest here, but I, I I I I'll say it this way: I believe I was something of a precocious child growing up. So my the, my my mother had me when she was 20 years old. And, and one of the things that she jokes about, she says, you know, Mari and I, we grew up together. And, and 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 judge my mother if you want, but as I was growing up, when I was old enough to have conversations with her, she and I would have some some very evolved types of conversations, even as a child. And I don't know if she was just trying to get some stuff off her chest or she really thought I could take it. But one of the things that she would share with me when I would sort of witness things that would go on between her and my mother and my, my stepfather was that she said, you know, Mari, take this as a lesson because when you have two people who are working together, they could barely have, this is an almost a direct quote, she said, they could barely have two nickels to rub together and they could live like kings and queens. But the reverse is also true. You can have two people who are making extraordinary salaries, but if they're working against each other, then they'll live like paupers. And even though my mother was a Chicago public school teacher, my father, uh, was and is uh, a Chicago public librarian, um, we definitely had the experience, I had the experience of that we were poor. There were things that we just didn't have, even though in those days, that was those, those were two people who, if they worked together, would have considered, uh, could have been considered to have a very good family. So when I was growing up, my, my experience, like the overarching sort of thoughts and uh, 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 ideas I had about what life would be like for me as an adult would, were, one, what do I need to do not to make the mistakes of my parents and to be a powerful, responsible uh, a householder, husband, uh, father, uh, number one. Number two, what can I do to contribute to others who are in a very similar space? Because I, in, in, you know, I grew up in, in Roseland, so uh, during a, a tremendous transition, which, you can, which I've learned now that you can relate to uh, in that area, that it wasn't just me. There were all types of other kids in my neighborhood who I hung out with who were dealing with levels of dysfunction. So 
um, by the grace of God, I just I I I, I developed as a, as an interest, and I think it very much so is a part of what I uh, do now, which is attempting to make have other people really discover for themselves their money conversation, how to get to the source of that, how to break through that, to have something else be available that wouldn't otherwise be predictable given their backgrounds. Yeah, that's profound. Um, today you continue to help businesses, right? Um, kind of, and I'm teaching entrepreneurship programs. I was at a school earlier today and, you know, and I'm one of, one of this project that I'm working on and I, I keep saying like, look, if we're talking business, I mean, we're not talking business if we're not talking numbers, if we're not talking money, you know, we're just talking ideas. We start talking business when we start talking these numbers. Uh, I'm finding that a lot of business owners, and I'm talking about the, seems like, and I'm making this up in my own head, it seems like the majority of business owners have not gone to business school. Or let me, uh, let me restate there's no, that. There's no question about that. Yeah, yeah. the majority yeah, of people yeah. who want to start a business have not gone to a business school. So they don't have any of the formal in-depth classes, the theory or application courses that have even allowed them to simulate or think through on a deep level some of these concepts about business. Uh, so when I say you're not talking business if you're not talking numbers and 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 and, and uh, profits and statistics or something. Yeah. You and I recently were having some conversation about black folks and money, mm. how much we spend, how much we generate. Talk to us about your take on black folks in business and the importance of getting them their minds wrapped around cash flow and money and access to money and capital, particularly yeah. in your line of work at um, capital. Uh, I'll get the name. Community uh, capital. Tax community and capital. Yeah. Yep. Community capital. Yep. Yeah. Talk yeah. to us about that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, you just said a, a few really interesting things that I want to just kind of underline a, a bit. Like, yeah, if you're not, talking about numbers you're not really in business and most business owners not being and having gone to business school i'm not sure what your feelings are about this i actually am, am, am of the belief now my I, my thoughts are changing now about modern traditional education and how much it really prepares us for being in business either so i'm not so sure even if they had gone to to school that that would have prepared them either and this and i am going to come to this whole point about you know black folk and entrepreneurship and whatnot as well, but 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 it, it's an important thing I think for people to look at because there's there's knowing some of the more technical aspects of what it is to run a business or an operate a business, which are valuable and they're needed. But then there's a whole world of understanding entrepreneurship, like as a psychology, as a as a way of operating, as a way of being in the world, and that's something that I would say that's even more detrimental to entrepreneurs, certainly African American entrepreneurs. Uh, than understanding the kind of the brass tacks and the 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 the, the I dots and the T crosses and whatnot. Um, there are just some things that you're not going to find in the college course. There's just some things that you're not going to find on Google with respect to how to run a business. You know, one of you know my favorite books is The E Myth by Michael Gerber, and he makes probably the most brilliant distinction that I've ever heard between people who start businesses as technicians, like most people think, because I I can cook or, or then I can run a restaurant or because I can, I can fix some things and I deserve to be a contractor or because I'm, I'm a doctor or a lawyer or engineer and accountant that, that that then entitles me or equips me in some way to run a medical practice or a law practice or, a, or a accounting practice. They're very different animals. Like the business of business is a whole world into itself. That's just as voluminous and just, and takes just as much effort to learn as whatever it is that your specialty is. So, Broadly speaking, yeah, you're right. Most business owners, as, as, as odd as it may sound, don't have a lot of business acumen, which mm -hmm. in my view explains a lot of the statistics that we hear about what percentage of business owners fail in the first few years and what percentage of business owners are left after that. And what our business is, is a community capital tax and accounting is, is, is really attempts to specialize in. Is helping to take people by the hand and walk them through those variety of spaces and help them to discover for themselves whatever they need to and have their business to have their business 
uh, uh, really begin to take on a life of its own because we suggest that it's not so much of a mystery so long as you understand the game. And so with that said, there's a there's a certain brand of that, if you will, that exists for black folks. So kind of along the lines of that, you know, when 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 uh, when white folks catch a, catch a cold, black folks catch pneumonia. So if it's bad for for majority society, it's really awful for us because uh, not only do we not have those opportunities to attend university and sort of at least get our, our beats wet beats wet with what could be possible with entrepreneurship, we don't have that 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 uncle or that 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 auntie or that 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 elder statesman around the corner or or, um, or anyone who can take us under the wing and really show us the finer points and the nuances of entrepreneurship. And it, it's, it's, it is what's, in my view, directly attributable to a lot of what we're dealing with in this day and age. So when people point to certain injustices that we as Black folks still deal with in the world, I believe that one of the conversations that's conspicuously off or absent is about the economic aspects of things and how we are uh, not, we're missing a lot of things, but one of the really key things that we're missing is a very, very strong business community who also have a sort of community mindedness to them such that they're able to invest and reinvest in, in our communities around the country. Yeah, so let's, let's talk, let's talk some numbers. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, um... You, you and I were talking. You, you put me on to some statistics. Mm-hmm. A trillion dollars. What is that? The yeah. number of trip black folks have spent trillion dollars. Trillion. Yeah, yeah. This year, What's that? I think I heard some. I think I, 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 I don't. I can't quote it directly. Mm-hmm. But um, I heard a brother say this year we've spent black people have spent a trillion dollars. Yeah, Just yeah in twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah, so no, far. I- and that, that's been growing. I think when Ken Michael first published the target market um, news periodical, that number was like uh, uh, a few billion dollars or something like that. And so now I, I'm not surprised to hear that it would have gone to a trillion dollars. So far in 2023, and I'm talking mm-hmm. like as of July of 2023, mm-hmm. this is new stuff, right? Yeah, and that it's been on primarily tobacco, alcohol, um, hair, and there's yeah. another there's another category. One point six trillion dollars so far this year. Yeah, so black folks got a trillion point six billy. <laughs> well, I don't know if they have that. Well, oh, we you- we we it comes through our hands. No, no, that's the, no, that, but I think that's an important distinction. What comes to our hands isn't necessarily what we have. So, and that's the part, that. right? So this is the meat of this is the meat of the potatoes of the conversation, people, right here. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the that's the the, the part where you and I were reviving at about a few weeks yeah. ago, because uh, my so the gentleman who coined this this phrase, black buying power, a guy by the name of Ken Michael with Target Market News, and he and I before he passed away. Uh, he's a brilliant brother, uh, and I, I honor him because he's, he's a major mentor and influence of mine. But he and I would battle because my very similar to what we were just talking about. My thing to him was that look, black buying power is the biggest misnomer there is because number one, it, even if you could get black folks to 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 pool their spending and say, you know, we're not going to shop with this particular entity anymore, where are we going to go? Because we don't produce anything. So even what? And, and, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we don't. Of our businesses are all service-based businesses, and so there's, there's not very much of anything that we produce. And and I don't say that as a criticism. I say that as like, well, can we create another number, another measure, another metric that actually tracks what we own and control? And you know, Ken and I would go back and forth about that. He he, he disagrees with me on a number of different different points. But uh, but you I came up that. with another number though. And I did come up with another number. I mean, the other number. Uh, so, well, so Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that's your question. I want to make sure I'm answering your well, question. Well, I know you you came up even with a name for the number. Yeah. Well, well, I so so I I'm creating a construct called the Black Equity, the Black Index, the Black Equity Index. There we go. There. We and go. and what it what it's designed to be is a a a, a, a mechanism tantamount to 
the Dow Jones or the, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500, but what would it be like if we had a number that indicated, that was indicative of, that was signified the level of black wealth that we have in this country? And what could that mean? Um, I, could, I could say a lot about what it means, but, but the thing that really made it click for me, I was listening to our brother, Dr. Claude Anderson one day, and he was making the suggestion, the assertion that, uh, that a lot of what we experience in terms of social injustice has to do with the fact that we don't own and control anything to the degree that, we, that, that, that social justice or injustice is perhaps a lot more black and white than many of us realize. And that if we owned and controlled more of the resources that this country possessed, that would naturally lead to a power base that we don't currently enjoy. And what he said was, black folks in America control one half of 1% of this country's resources. That's why we face a lot of the injustices, the oppressions, the indignities that we face, because we don't own and control anything. And I said, wow, that's an interesting statistic. Let me see if I can find that somewhere online. And I couldn't find it. And so I said, well, surely he got it from somewhere. And I attempted to back into it. So I Googled net worth of the black populace in America. And I couldn't find that either. And I'm scratching my head now at this point. And I'm thinking like, well, surely there, mu there must have been some research center that's asked this question before me. Uh, and, and I, I couldn't. I, I, I'd search and search and search. I said, well, you know what? Here's what I'll do. I'll back into it because you can find the average net worth of the average black family, but not in aggregate. So I just did some simple math. I said, okay, look, the average net worth of the average black family is $4,000. Now that's compared to the average white family of $110,000. That's a whole separate subject, right? About what causes that wealth gap to be what it is. But that aside, okay, $4,000 multiplied by the 40 some odd uh, 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 million of us that are in this country. Uh, and so I came up with a number of $168 billion. That's our aggregate net worth, $168 billion. And so then I Googled the net worth of the United States, which came out to $124 trillion. So then I thought to myself, $168 billion, uh, $124 trillion. You know, sounds about right. And you know, that's the point divide, of 0.5%. You divide $168 billion, $124 trillion. So yeah, if you can't appreciate large numbers, you'll think like, oh, that's 168 billion. That's a lot of money compared to the total amount of money that exists mm -hmm. in this country, the amount of resources and how they're valued. Yeah. That's one half of 1%. That was Dr. Uh, Claude Anderson's statistic and how you come up with it. Now, the question then that, that hit me was, oh, snap, that's horrible. Mm. But what would justice look like okay. economically? And I said, well, that's easy. If we make up 12, 13, 14% of this population, what would 12, 13, 14% of $124 trillion be? And the number is $17 trillion. And then I began to wonder, and I began to imagine, I began to call smart people like Scott Stewart and others and ask them like, man, what do you think $17 trillion would actually feel like? What would the state of our families be? What would mm -hmm. be the state of our communities and our neighborhoods be? What would our interactions with each other look like? What would it look like when people got on, on, on the television and said things and did things and, 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 and insulted black folks. And, and, and what, what would it look like if we, uh, 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 if we had $17 trillion? What would, our community, what would our social service organizations look like? What would our lobbying agencies look like? And, and to a person, everybody I spoke with said, wow, it would be a state change. And this is something we want to invite people to, not just to purely ideate about, but really to look at from the standpoint of like, well, how do we get there? How do we get to $17 trillion? And, and my view, and we're going to have a whole you know, conversation about this as well, is that the easiest way to get there is to start strong businesses that can produce powerful valuations. But again, it comes back to your point about not understanding the numbers. Because many people who are in small business, they'll understand revenue and expenses. They'll understand profits and losses. They'll understand assets and liabilities and, and maybe to some degree another equity, but very, very, very few small business owners understand value, how to create value in the marketplace. And I'm not talking about a Google review. I'm not talking about somebody no, no, says no. five star, you know, you're great. That's important too. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, what does it mean? What does it look like to create a business, not just to serve your own personal needs, but as a real mechanism for building wealth? And that as you build a business that can sustain 
a 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, 50 million dollar uh, valuation. Yeah. What that means in terms of helping to build and create wealth within our communities and what that contributes towards the state change that we're all pressing for to be in a different state as a people. That's what, that's what the numbers have to do with how we begin to connect social and community justice to what we have to do from an economic vantage point. And, um, and man, that's absolutely phenomenal, brother, that you, that, that's why you are the scientist of the numbers, man. You that, are that's helped. Those financial scientists, help. brother. Yeah, help. that's the that's financial. Process back in the day, so, so you know. Huh. So, um, building strong businesses that have real solutions to to problems that are scalable and sustainable mm -hmm. right um you have an opportunity right now it's not even a shameless plug it's just it is what it is you are the founder and ceo of community capital accounting correct yeah tell me what makes your work so unique so important to people like myself and our listeners, even the listeners of educators, but anybody who truly desires to turn their business into something that will be game changing for their family and their community. Tell us what community capital accounting is doing. Do sure. well. Fundamentally, we're, we're where we start is with the accounting side of things. We start with performing basic books, tax planning, tax preparations, and we perform an advisory service that, that involves helping to create forecasts and helping to work with our clients to make sure that they understand the game of business, which is to uh, fundamentally to profit and to grow. And again, not just as a perfunctory matter, not just as a matter of like, hey, I want, I want my house, I want my Bentley, I want my, whatever your goals are, which there's nothing wrong with. But what we're committed to is that every small business owner that we work with crosses that sort of Rubicon from being self-employed or having the business be squarely resting upon their shoulders to be being something that that has a life of its own. So one of the things that we say is that you know great businesses aren't run by great people. Great businesses are run by great systems. Uh, great systems run great businesses, and uh, and you find average people to manage great systems, and that's how you end up with something that has a so that has a turnkey element to it. And we want to educate as many small business owners as we possibly can on how to uh, affect that process. But what's unique about us is that we, again, we have our eye on. And if you want to frame a reference for what I'm talking about, and just read, you know, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cash Flow Quadrant, and the idea of moving from employed to self-employed to being a business owner to being an investor. And we think that sort of bridge moving from self-employed to business owner from business owner to investor is a, is a really radical concept and something that ultimate small business owners could really stand to learn from because when your business takes on a life of its own it creates more jobs it creates more opportunities for the communities that it serves but again to the point of what we were saying before it creates wealth and not just wealth from a from a from a selfish sort of hedonistic state but but wealth from the standpoint if from from our communities, what does it mean? What does it look like when you have real examples of small business leadership in our communities along our corridors that young people can look up to this, despite the condition of their respective families can say, hey, I want to be like that guy, you know, uh, Kobe, uh, LeBron James and uh, uh, you name the celebrity, you know, they're, they're all cool. But, but, but I'm looking at this guy, this, this lady every day and they're in the community and they're, they're, they're the kind of person who I really could see myself being like that. And this is, and this is somebody I could walk up to and say hello to, to the degree that we can get something like that going where we could really create something like you said, that can scale and grow. Now we can have a real conversation, I believe, about what it takes to create generational wealth in a meaningful way outside of this sort of individualistic frame that, that we mostly talk about generational wealth wealth with that how do you define what's the omari kamal's definition of generational wealth 
Yeah, I mean, generational wealth, I mean, for me, is is, is certainly, you know, on a basic level, ge- wealth that lasts throughout a multiple, multiple generation. Um, but the the big question is, and then mostly people look at that as like, well, there's there's some number attached to that. And that's true. You know, if you one of the quick exercises I do with people to help them figure out what their sort of number is, what their financial freedom number is. Like, what do I get to a point where I'm not in a space where I'm working because I want to, I'm working, where I'm not working because I have to, I'm working because I want to. Most of us are working because we have to. But where do you have to, what do you have to do to get to a place where you're working because you want to? And I say, well, you, you think first about how much money you need to be comfortable. When I say comfortable, I'm not talking about Rolls Royce or, you know, a uh, house in the, in the hills or anything like that. I'm talking about a nice house that suits your needs with a nice car. All your insurances are paid up. All your saving money, all of that. In the society that we live in, I won't get into a lot of math of it, particularly in the city. Um, most people need to make about $150,000 just to keep head and nose above water. Now that's a whole other conversation that we could have. Okay. Right, because I thought I thought that my number was to that point. I would have mm-hmm. just said two hundred fifty thousand yeah. to to be okay yeah, to, to be breathe okay. to be able to breathe a little bit and have all of those things paid. Uh, yeah, okay, we, we'll settle okay. in there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an individual question, but it's, it's certainly not forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars anymore. You know what I mean? And 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 that's a whole nother issue because less than five, ten percent of the American populace is making above $100,000 anyway. So if it takes you $150,000 just to keep your head and nose above water without making any uncomfortable sacrifices, that's that's a problem too. But suffice to say, $150,000, $200,000 is about what you need to make. If you're going to have a, a, a set of investments that has a value that's going to pay you back that money as a dividend, then if you, you got to take that number and multiply it times 20 in order to see what your number is, what your financial freedom number is. So if it's $150,000, it's $3 million. If it's $250,000, it's $5 million. And you're talking about that money is, mm -hmm. this is what's liquid. That's what's what's liquid and or it cash flows. Okay. And cash flow is, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's producing cash flow enough, whether it has an air. It's not tied up in property. This is not what's tied up in insurance policies. This is what you have access this to. Is what you actually have access to. Okay. But yep. give or take, we can talk about asset allocation in the whole world of how that works. But but ultimately, your number is somewhere around equity position of three to five million dollars in order to be in order to be what most of us would call rich. Now, rich is a very individualistic sort of concept, right? But we start talking about generational wealth. That means that you have a much, much, much larger figure than that, that not only takes care of your needs, but takes care of your children's needs and your children's children's needs and so forth and so on. The problem is this, with generational wealth, there's the there's the number, because you asked me like, well, what is it for me? So for me, it's, it's not only what it is, like in terms of, like you said, what are the numbers associated with it, right? What serves your needs versus what serves the next generation, next generation, next generation. There's that. But what I believe is that at some point or another, it's not enough to just say, I want my family to be taken care of. Because if you think about it hard enough, you don't really want that. You don't want your children to not have to work. You don't want your children to to, to not have to learn what it is to earn their way in life. You don't, you, do, you, do you want them to suffer the same discomforts that you did? Absolutely not. But you don't want them to just breeze through life either without having to deal with anything right you don't want to just give them life and so which is why i believe so many people aren't successful at achieving at accomplishing uh just i mean you look at the children of these uber billionaires right they're not the greatest greatest set of people in the world they're not the best global citizens in the world because they've been handed everything in their whole lives so even if you achieve that level of wealth the question becomes why would you do it and so for me, really tr- a, a movement of people who are generating uh, generational wealth, they have to lock into something bigger than, hey, what's in it for me? What's in it for me and mine? There has to be some larger philosophy, interest in mind that we can lock into. And I think that's a critical, critical part of what we have to deal with. So going all the way back full circle to those kitchen table conversations, 
And there's kitchen table conversations that exist at the level of family, but there's also kitchen tables that exist at the level of dope people podcast that are happening like this. And I think that's why this is so important because we need to be able to talk through these concepts and, and, and grapple with each other about what is it that we want to say that we believe in and what we want to say that we ascribe to that's going to have us go out and do the work that we know to do, not for our own selfish intentions. So that's the, unfortunately, that's not the way life works. You know, if you do anything from purely selfish motives alone, it never quite turns out well. But when you give your, your when you, you devote yourself to a higher principle, there, there, there's a pull, I believe, for what wants to be there beyond just your immediate needs that ultimately makes the kind of thing that we're talking about, like the real idea of general generational wealth beyond the concept available um, in a way that it wouldn't be otherwise. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and I, I'm glad you said that. I mean, you know, the number isn't important in my world. You know, part of what I want to do is set up the system right the systems for my student for my children to not have to wake up every morning to be so concerned with what bill they need to pay or where they're behind like i I would love to just like money to not be the issue let's figure out how we're going to solve some of the world's problems and serve other people but i need to not be worried about do i have enough on my card when i go to get dinner or of course how much gas i can put in my car or you know knowing that i need new tires and when i'm you know those types of things i'd love to not be the issue um but setting up the systems for my children to have cash flow for generations to come and that's a part of, and again, it's part of a larger conversation, but I want to take us out with this question. If you could surmise, what should business owners be doing to create generational wealth? Um, Well, what, what I think they should be doing to create generational wealth is to um, and I think you just said it. I think ultimately the the business of real business owners is building the business itself. Like the best businesses, and there are lots of ways I can I think I think I can answer that question, Scott. But the, the thing that comes to mind most immediately is that small business owners have to get their heads around the fact that the business needs to exist outside of them as quickly as possible. So when you put your business plans together, the question, like a critical question has to be, what does my business model have to look like such that I can make my first hire as quickly as possible? Who is that critical first hire that I need to make? And how quickly can I get this thing to the point where I can, again, to take another Robert Kiyosaki line, I can leave town, I can go on vacation for a whole year and the business will still be running by the time I get back and perhaps even be doing better than if I were there. And I think if you stand there and you begin to get interested in what it takes to get to that place sooner than later, what it is to have a business. And what I mean, what I mean by business is that again, that business runs without you. Mm. It can run without you. I mean, sure, you can be there and be a helpful contributor and and attempt to figure out how to get it to its next level. That's all great. But on some level, it's reached a point of stability where it can go and grow without your involvement uh, being absolutely necessary. And when you do that, and when you crack that particular code, you have something that's going to continue to evolve Mm -hmm. and produce profit and produce earnings and likewise produce value in the marketplace. And if you have something like that, that is almost literally a money machine mm, that mm-hmm. will not just produce income for you, but obviously it'll create jobs for other people and opportunities for other people like investors and bankers and whatnot. We're all profiting and, and growing off of your success. So talk about generational wealth in terms of not just what's available for you and your family, but you're also creating jobs, opportunities, and wealth 
for others as well, because again, you figured out the, a way to set into an emotion, a, 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 a perpetual motion type of instrument. And really that's what, that's what business is. And if you become interested in that, and that's something that calls to you, then that is, in my opinion, your surest ticket to generational wealth by understanding basic business principles and those basic business principles translate over to anything else that you want to do, whether it be investing in the stock market or investing in real estate or uh, investing in cryptocurrency or understanding AI and the various forces that it's going to affect and, and likewise that affect it. So like that, uh, that's for me, again, uh, understanding business is the critical access to, to, to building generational wealth. And once you really understand business in the truest sense, you know, it, it, I hate to say, use this phrase, but I think it, it applies in this case. It just sort of takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal, brother. This, uh, again, in our spaghetti, spaghetti sense of conversation, we were kind of all over the place, but I think it was still very much um, a direct and poignant conversation around wealth and the uncovering and pulling back the layers on understanding how money works in business. And I'd love to entertain you for some more conversations in the future on this platform or a okay. different platform where we can continue to share light on this work for many of our listeners and folks that are interested in starting their own business. Where can the people catch up with you at, man? And let, let the people know where they can find you on social media, all your, drop all your links, man. And we'll put everything in the show notes as well. Great, great. Yeah, so you can uh, find us on C, at c3accounting.com. at C, the number three, accounting.com. Uh, you can find us on social media, Profit Growth CFO. That's Profit Growth CFO on Instagram and Twitter. You can just look us up, Community Capital Tax and Accounting on Facebook. You can call us too, 888-227-8790. Uh, That's 888-227-8790. So that's how you find us. Any final words for the people? Anything that we didn't get to say or that you want to make sure that you communicate before we wrap this edition? Yeah, yeah. That I'm grateful, man. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, look, I mean, just that it, it, it seems a little bit glorious for me to like to, to even show up to a, a dope people podcast. That's not how I walk around relating to myself. But look, I, I'm learning to take in, uh, to, to, to learn to trust people like you and the people around me and, and that you all see see me better than I see myself. But, um, but but really, I'm honored you know, to be with you always. I have a deep and abiding love and respect for you. And, 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 and even though I, I, it's an honor for me to be a dope people podcast, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here too. Because I know only dope people, but listen to the dope people podcast. I'm, I'm looking forward to the interactions and perhaps some of the, some of the avenues that'll be open by virtue of me being with you. Absolutely, man! Is you have the respect. You have always been one of those guys mm. who I'm honored to know. I'm mm. glad that you pick up the phone when I call. And trust me, and I'm not blowing smoke, man. You one of the guys. You your brain your knowledge, your style, how you move, how you get down, your conversation, your intention, your purpose, is it's uh, not in vain. It is recognized, man. And so this is one way that I could give flowers is by recognizing you as a dope person. You are officially dope stamped. You didn't need it. You, was, you had to already be dope to be on the show, so you don't need our stamp. No, I you do. Was dope. I do. You was I dope need and are dope. <laughs> so uh shout out to you and your lovely family and all the work that you do keep hanging in there i appreciate you being on and look forward to having you back in the very near future to all of our listeners from all over the world i'm talking about south africa i see you i see you in china i see you in japan india europe i could go through them all i see y'all in in california and in new york New York is holding us down. Philly, Dallas, Detroit, all over the city of Chicago. We love you. You already know what it is. Until next time, people. Peace.